type intensive gardens. You know, to set that up, like you were talking about your friends in Montreal, mm -hmm. they have a, a market very close by. That's why they're able to make that kind of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody eats. Everybody pays for food. So, you know, why is it that only certain places can have a successful CSA? Mm -hmm. I have not seen them in years, and those are both males. There was three of them. Three males. A friend of Sharon's dropped into Sharon's 100-year-old farmhouse today to chat, and I have the good fortune of meeting Neev, who is was born in Ireland but lives in the United States, and you're involved in the food movement, and we're going to have a little conversation. Right? Sounds great. Got a new BFF. <laughs> Let's see. Just, just for for the heck of it, <laughs> tell them what you do. Uh, well, this year I'll be working with the Historic Lewis Farmers Market, which received a grant from the USDA to, it's a farmers market promotion grant, and we'll be doing research on three main things, uh, making the farmers market sustainable long term. Uh, so that they can hire, right now it's a volunteer board, so having hired employees to, to run it. Um, and this is just for, for a particular city? Uh, it's in Lewis, Delaware, on the eastern shore. Okay. And uh, so on the peninsula. And uh, the other part is trying to diversify the markets so there aren't, uh, it's in terms of, you know, racial, ethnic, income, you know, just in general trying to di diversify the market. And for are example, you are you talking about in terms of who's selling at the market or who's buying at the market? Well, I, I personally feel like both. So the right now it looks like the focus is more on who's buying. But I think that when you diversify who's selling, you'll also diversify who's, exactly. who's buying. Exactly. Um, and so well, one of the things we'll be focusing on this year is SNAP. So it's uh, the modern day equivalent of uh, the food stamps. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Right now, only 2% of people on SNAP or who use SNAP actually redeem it at a farmer's market. And that means, you know, 98% of people on food stamps don't, don't is that, buy. Is that awareness or is that convenience or is that just a cultural habit? Uh, it might be a combination of all of these things. So that's okay. part of our research with the grant this year is to look more deeply into that and get a better understanding of ways to bridge uh, the SNAP uh, people with with farmers markets because everybody should have the ability to access fresh fruits and vegetables. Healthy food, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it seems to me if you've got if you've got like food stamps, it's the, it's the equivalent of food stamps. Uh, you should have the opportunity to go and buy from the farmers market and get mm -hmm. healthy food, mm -hmm. which might not be available in your corner market or whatever's close to your house or where you shop. Right. Right. And one of the nice things about the market that I'll be working with this year is uh, that they do a, a market match program. So for every twenty dollars that somebody on food stamps spends at a farmers market, the market will give another twenty dollars for the customer to to spend. So you're really getting a big bang for your $20 buck. is $40 mm -hmm. spent. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, so you'd think that and that comes from the state of Delaware. Um, that is actually privately raised by the farmers market itself because they want to make sure that people can uh, afford to buy at, at a farmers market. And that's just an incentive to go too. Right. you know, if you go, hey, you know, I can get healthy food, I can maybe have to spend a little bit more for organic food. But I get this incentive, you know, this this uh, it's like a rebate, really, an instant rebate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's worth making the trip there. Right. right, and so this is why part of it could just be that it's not advertised properly or marketed, because if people knew that essentially it's free money, you'd expect more people would come. With only 2% right. of people coming, you know, we really need to look at what are the barriers and why is that not happening. So, so this is something you're studying or this is something you're actually doing? We're studying. 
okay. this year and and doing we'll be doing some work on it as well and trying to see what's the most effective way to bridge that gap that's great. Well, mm -hmm. do you think that, that what you find in your research will be uh, applicable towards other states? Will this information get to other cities and other states? Well, good you ask. We're going to be putting together a best practices guidebook or workbook great. for other farmers markets, so it will be available. And so are, when you're, are you talking to the uh, organic farmers about this and are they getting excited about uh, what you're doing or is this all too new? Um, we are talking about the, this with the producers that come to the Lewis market. Uh, we have an annual meeting before the market begins and shared some of this information and also asked for ideas from the producers themselves. Right. Well, it takes, um, uh, you know, learning from Sharon, it takes a lot of effort to, to grow a market garden. A huge amount of, of, of effort so I would think anything that like this a program like this would really give them even more incentive an organic farmer even more incentive uh, to to have a, a, a market garden mm -hmm. to, to bring their wares to the market yeah and so another part of the research is doing actual experiments on what's the best way to price your products or the best way to set up your stall and see what has the biggest impact on actual sales uh, so there's only incidental uh, information out there about what's the most effective way to price your products at a farmer's market so we'll actually be doing a data collection and a, and a quantitative uh, study of, of the most effective methods for pricing which should be uh, useful for farmers in any market and uh, the farmers with this market and producers do seem really excited about the idea. That's it. awesome. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Have you ever been to the uh, farmers markets in California? You know I'm in California no, and we I have haven't. farmers markets, major farmers markets all over Los Angeles and um, well I'd say there are there are probably between five and 20 times the size of the one I visited yesterday mm. in Salisbury. Mm -hmm. um, but Los Angeles is a big city and we have a lot of farmers, you know, not within an hour or two from Los Angeles. Uh, would you like to come out and uh, uh, check out our farmers markets? Of course, I've been to farmers markets in New Orleans. In, oh, I bet that's awesome. Uh, huge and there are many of them. It's great. And Dublin, Ireland and Galway, Ireland. Um, do, do you have any interest in, in uh, living in Ireland? I, I have lived in Ireland and I uh, would be interested in returning, absolutely. Wow, mm -hmm. and, and especially after you get your, your uh, research done, mm -hmm. you know, you could take that home and the, the problem you were saying earlier, the problem with, with Ireland is it rains every day. Not every day, but pretty, right? pretty close to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how, do, how do farmers manage uh, with, with that much rain? Uh, well, I don't really have the answer to that. I didn't do a whole lot of farming while I was there. I was involved with a, an agroforestry group, um, but uh, was more focused with the tree parts and the tree nurseries. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had a friend who worked with, a, she has, has a medicinal garden, um, mm -hmm. so I worked a little bit with that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, they grow a lot of potatoes, don't they? Or is that Scotland? Uh, no, it's Ireland. It was the potato famine that like drove right, everybody except, to except the except uh, cotton of the United States. Although now they're re re revisiting, revisiting the idea of calling it a potato famine. And uh, there was, yeah, yeah, there was actually plenty of food um, to be eaten, but it was being all exported to, to England ah. at the time. Yeah. Political. Food. Had nothing food. To do with potatoes. Pretty much. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Food is political. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. This is a stainless steel bucket. They still sell them. But my sister used to walk out into the pasture every morning before school and milk our, Ger our Guernsey cow mm. and bring the, bring the cr milk up to the house and strain it. And we made our own butter and cream and, you know, so every day that was her job. I had to feed chickens, thousands of them. My brother had to feed the pigs. Uh, this is one of the relics or remnants of uh, both farms. My husband's farm in the Adirondacks, which was a dairy mm -hmm. and the local farm where I grew up a mile that way. Mm -hmm. with my German and Swiss grandparents. I still have their size from both sides of the fa family. I have devices that my grandfather grew, you, made for the farm, and also horse-drawn equipment from my grandfather's farm. Most small, sustainable farms, uh, integrated farms, raising livestock and being self-supported, have disappeared. They're gone. They've disappeared in, in, for corporate industrial agriculture.
Right. And very few farmers actually garden anymore. I know. How do we get back to that? Uh, stop going to restaurants and grocery stores. <laughs> Well, I think go I, to the farm. That's exactly start to garden. You're the, you're 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 part of the movement, Kay. But, that that's exactly what Jeff Poppin said. Yeah. Really, I said really. I said how are we going to change it, Jeff? And he said, go just back what, to the land. Go back to the land. Start gardening, and begin by going to a farm or place that already knows how to garden. Begin to garden, because it starts there. Right. And also, if you don't, a lot of people say, well, they tell me in California, well, I don't have a yard. Yeah. And I say the same thing that Jeff said, which is what you're saying, is find, if you're a landless gardener, Go find, find someone a farmer who's a got land. My biggest problem is I can't find any help. How am I supposed to go to a market and produce all this food to make it easily available to people if I don't have anybody help doing the work? Right. right. So I offer an educational garden that actually teaches people to garden. Right. And I mentor people with their own gardens, even if it's just a few buckets in their front yard or mm -hmm. a garden the size of yours. Mm -hmm. But they could also grow way more food here because I already have the compost. I already have the well, the water. Right. And the seedlings and 50 years of gardening experience. Right. So I would prefer to have people come to my farm. Many farms don't want consumers going to the farm. Right. They are too busy farming and harvesting and going to market. And, and they really just don't have time. Sharon said that there are a lot of different types of farms. Farms, And I was saying that uh, there is a need to have lots of different types of farms and there's a place for them. Right, yeah. right. right. It's not all just big farms. There's small farms and small operations. Or to go travel the world. He should be able to do that without getting into large scale farming. You know, mm -hmm. so that's, that's my point is there's room for, <laughs> there's many different ways. Tell, tell us about identifying the weeds and why that's important. Well, an awful lot of Americans are focused on, on killing them all. Um, but most weeds, or many weeds, are more nutritious than anything you buy in a store. So they're very nourishing and they're very medicinal and they need to be included in our diets. Uh, it's not only that, but we need, if we are ever um, stranded in an airplane in the middle of the wilderness and want to survive, it's pretty important to know what's edible and what's not, what will kill you and what will nourish you. Um, and if you're a gardener and you're planting your, your crops, it's really important to know the difference between a seedling that is a crop you're planting and a weed right. that are just emerging. So it's all education. Do you cut your own wood? No, I support my local woodcutter. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> and there's a big black thing right there. Yeah, and farm people in the farm world know that there are, you know, sheds and all that kind of stuff. Oh, they do. <laughs> uh, so I wouldn't necessarily at this moment be best situated to answer that, but it seems okay, like I'll, I'll just cut that question out. <laughs> it seems like people get by just fine. <laughs> You were just saying that what you what you like to do is help people identify the weeds. Can you Amongst just other things. Can, tell the difference? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry.